Dear friends, welcome to e Shala. I am Dr. Vishal Jadav, Associate Professor of Sociology at Tilak Maharashtra Vidya Peet, Pune. Today, we are going to do a module called The Main Concerns of Political Sociology, State, Class, Status, Ideology and Power in the paper Political Sociology. How is the social related to the political? How is power reproduced from generation to generation in different societies? What is the understanding of the Marxists in terms of ideology and power? How do the Weberians understand power, class, status and party? And how are these two views brought together in the modern context? How would Foucault understand power which is not necessarily vested within the state? This module therefore tries to understand from a political sociology view how the state and how society influence each other in constructing power. Class, the study of inequalities in society is one of the most important areas for sociology. Class is a concept in sociology which is used to denote one of the major axis of social stratification in society, one based mainly on the position one occupies in the economic structure. Within sociology, class became very important with the coming of Marxism. Marx and Angels claim that the history of all hitherto existing society was the history of class struggle. For Marx, a social class is a group of people who stand in a common relationship to the means of production, the means by which they gain a livelihood. In modern society, the two main classes consist of those who own the means of production like factories and capital, industrialists or capitalists and those who earn their living by selling their labor to them, the working class or the proletariat. According to Marx, the relationship between classes is an exploitative one. In feudal societies, exploitation often took the form of the dry, direct transfer of produce from the peasantry to the aristocracy. Serfs were compelled to give a certain proportion of their production to their aristocratic master or had to work for a number of days each month in his field to produce crops to be consumed by him and his retinue. In modern capitalist societies, the source of exploitation is less obvious. In the course of the working day, Marx reasoned, workers produce more than is actually needed by employers to repay the cost of hiring them. The surplus value is the source of profit which capitalists are able to put to their own use. Marx's view on class has come under major criticism for several quarters. Critics see the long-term social trends as moving away from Marx's theoretical predictions. Marx's characterization of capitalist society as splitting into two main camps, owners and workers, has been seen as too simple. Even within the working class, there are divisions between skilled and unskilled workers, which work to prevent a clear convergence of class interests. Such divisions have endured and become more complex with gender and ethnicity also becoming factors leading to the internal competition and conflicts. Without a developing class consciousness, there can be no concerted class action and hence no communist revolution. Max, Weber, appro Max Weber's approach to stratification was built on the analysis developed by Marx, but he modified and elaborated on it. Like Marx, Weber regarded society as characterized by conflicts over power and resources. Yet, where Marx saw polarized class relations and economic issues at the heart of all social conflict, Weber developed a more complex, multi-dimensional view of society. Social stratification is not simply a matter of class, according to Weber, but is shaped by two further aspects, status and party. These three overlapping elements of stratification produce an enormous number of possible positions within society rather than the more rigid bipolar model proposed by Marx. According to Weber, class divisions derive not only from the control or lack of control of the means of production, but from economic differences that have nothing directly to do with property. 
Such resources include especially the skills and credentials or qualifications which affect the type of work people are able to obtain. Weber argued that an individual's market position strongly influences his or her overall life chances. Those in managerial or professional occupations earn more and have more favorable conditions of work, for example, than people in blue-collar jobs. The American sociologist Eric Olin Wright has developed an influential theory of class which combines aspects of both Marx's and Weber's approaches. According to Wright, there are three dimensions of control over economic resources in modern capitalist production and these allow us to identify the major classes that exist. Control over investments or money capital, control over the physical means of production, land or factories and offices, control over labor power. Those who belong to the capitalist class have control over each of these dimensions in the production system. Members of the working class have control over none of them. In between these two main classes, however, are the groups whose position is more ambiguous, the managers and white collar workers. These people are in what Wright calls contradictory class locations because they are able to influence some aspects of production but are denied control over others. White collar and professional employees, for example, have to contract the labor power to employers in order to make a living in the same way as manual workers do. But at the same time, they have a greater degree of control over the work settings than most people in the blue collar jobs. Right terms the class position of such workers contradictory because they are neither capitalists nor manual workers. Yet, they share certain common features with each. Ideology. The concept of ideology has had different senses in its long historical life. Currently, it has survived in two senses, both as a set of illusions that needs to be criticized and as the vehicle for the construction of political hegemony. The first major contribution to the concept of ideology was by Marx and Engels. They argued that the ideas are shaped by the material world, but as historical materialists they understood the material to consist of relations of production that undergo change and development. For Marx and Engels, it is the exploitative and alienating features of capitalist economic relations that prompt ideas that dub ideology. Ideology only arises where there are social conditions such as those produced by private property that are vulnerable to criticism and protest. Ideology exists to protect these social conditions from attack by those who are disadvantaged by them. Marx in his study of capitalism distinguished the sphere of appearance, appearances, the market, from the sphere of inner relations or production and argued that there is a basic inversion at the level of production. Capitalist ideologies give an inverted explanation for market relations, for example, so that human beings perceive their actions as the consequences of economic factors rather than the way around, rather than the other way around, and moreover, thereby understand the market to be natural and inevitable. For instance, the values of freedom and equality present at the level of the market are ideological in that they conceal unfreedom and inequality at the level of production and thus, and thus force workers to go back time and again to the labor market. Ideology thus becomes a kind of distorted consciousness that masks the contradictions of society and also contributed to the reproduction of the system. After Marx, thinking about ideology branched into different trajectories within Marxism itself. For Gramsci, ideology was more than a false conception of the world or a system of ideas. It, had, it also had to do like religion with the capacity to inspire concrete attitudes and give certain orientations for actions. It is in ideology that social classes become aware of the position and historical role. And it is in and by ideology therefore that a class can exercise hegemony over other classes. By this Gramsci refers to the ability of a class to secure the addition and consent of the masses. Ideology for Gramsci has an integrating effect based on its ability to win the free consent of people. In Gramsci therefore, this hegemonic quality of worldview, its capacity to become a common sense of the masses is the key element in all political life. 
Louis Althusser, however, reintroduced an opposition between science and ideology and saw the main function of ideology as the interpolation of individuals to constitute them as subjects who either accept a subordinate role within the system or fight against it. He put forward the concept of the ideological state apparatus which operated through religion, education, trade unions and the mass media. The objective of all ideology is to achieve hegemony to convert individuals into supporters by providing them with articulated concepts and images that help them make sense of the social existence. Members of the Frankfurt School such as Habermas drew on Marxist idea of ideology as a distortion of reality to the point to point to its role in communication wherein interlocutors find that power relations prevail, prevent the open uncoerced articulation of beliefs and values. Theodore Adorno and, Mark Ho and Max Hokaima saw capitalism as marked by a growing importance of instrumental rationality and transformed ideology into a purely manipulative force that converges with reality, thus becoming unassailable. Herbert Marcus took this logic to the extreme in his view that reason and domination have ceased to be contradictory forces. Domination no longer requires repression as it can be achieved through the manipulation of needs. Outside of Marxism, we have had many different approaches to ideology. One important approach to ideology is Karl Mannheim's relationism. Mannheim held that all points of view have their claims to truth restricted on account of the social determination. At the same time, it is their social determination that gives them a distinctive truth or authenticity. Mannheim elaborated further on the idea of the complex relations between reality and ideology by pointing to the human need for ideology. Ideologies are neither true or false, but they are a set of socially conditioned ideas that provide a truth that people, both the advantaged and the disadvantaged, want to hear. This leads to the theory of ideology being replaced by a sociology of knowledge. The recent linguistic turn or the postmodern turn in social theory has produced new perspectives on ideology. Michael Friedan holds that ideologies are those systems of political thinking through which individuals and groups construct an understanding of the political world they inhabit and then act on that understanding. Ideologies decontest or nat naturalize the meaning of political terms by converting a variety of optional meanings into monolith certainty. Similarly, Laclau and Mofe argue that ideologies attempting, attempt to naturalize society itself by seeking to reestablish closure whenever a social order has been dislocated. They also seek to create a naturalized subject position for the construction of political identities. Power. The meaning, nature and distribution of power are central issues for political sociologists. There is a major disagreement in sociology between perspectives which define power as getting someone else to do what you want them to do. That is an exercising of power over against those which define it as the inability or capacity to act. That is as power to do something. Max Weber gave a general definition of power as a chance of a man or a number of men to realize their own will in a command action even against the resistance of others who are participating in the action. To Weber, power is about getting your own way even against the opposition of others. Most forms of power are not based solely on force but are legitimated by some form of authority. Max Weber's discussion of power focused on distinguishing between different categories or ideal types of authority. For Weber, there were three sources of authority, traditional, charismatic and rational legal. In the modern world, Weber argued rational legal authority was increasingly replacing traditional authority. This is power that is legitimated through legally enacted rules and regulations. It is found in modern organizations and bureaucracies and in government, which Weber described as the formal organizations that direct the political life of society. Stephen Luke's attempted to extend Weber's quote-unquote negative concept of power more thoroughly in order to cover all of its possible empirical instances by offering what he calls a three-dimensional view of power. He says one-dimensional study of power focuses on the ability to make decisions to go one's way in observable conflicts.
that is quote a has power over b to the extent that b that he can get b to do something that b would not otherwise do unquote two dimensional analysis looks at the ability of social actors and groups to control which issues are decided upon by this look means that groups or individuals that power with power can exercise it not just by making decisions in their own interest but by limiting the alternatives available to others some issues are kept off the agenda looks building on the previous two types argues that there is also a three dimensional perspective which makes for a radical view of power he calls this the manipulation of desires the supreme exercise of power to get another or others to have the desires you want them to have he points out that this does not necessarily mean that people are brainwashed for example capitalists exercise power over workers by shaping their desires through the media and other means of socialization to take on the role of worker and mass consumer looks points here that here is that ideological exercise of power is not explicitly observable or measurable but can be inferred when people act in ways that are against their own interests in this model quote a exercises power over b when a affects b in a manner contrary to b's interests the second approach has a more positive and productive evaluation of power it focuses on a capacity or potential to do something or to facilitate things this approach was initially developed in the diverse arguments of antonio gramsci talcott parsons and hena arden it has become mainstream with the rise of post structuralist theory firstly this approach concerns itself with the strategic strategies and techniques of power seeing it as diffused throughout a society rather than concentrated in sovereign organizations power is seen as collective property of social systems of cooperating actors that facilitates both collective empowerment and collective discipline Foucault has argued that power was not concentrated in one institution such as the state or held by any one group of individuals. He argued that these older models of power including that of Stephen Luke's relied on fixed identities. Power was held by groups that were easily identifiable. For example, the ruling class for Marxists or men for feminists. Instead, Foucault argues that power operates at all levels of social interaction and in all institutions by all people. Secondly, this approach also focused on the self-disciplining nature of how power operates. When Foucault referred to as the discursive formation of power operates through mechanisms of socialization and community building that produce individuals as subjects with particular kinds of mental orientation and routines of action. while the principles in power relations are formed as those who are authorized to discipline others the most effective and pervasive forms of power occur when people have learned to exercise a self discipline over their own behavior they have been discursively formed into subalterns who conform without the need for any direct action on the part of the principal thirdly power is also seen as productive and not just as repressive thus radical pluralists like Laclau and Mouffe see power and conflict not as discrete entities but as constitutive of social relationships. They criticize the liberal electoral models of politics, arguing that politics does not consist in simply registering already existing interests through elections, but plays a crucial role in shaping political subjects. Thus, identities are not discrete and fixed, and political agents are constituted and reconstituted through their conflictual relations with other members of the polity. In the post-structuralist tradition, then power and conflict is not something to be eliminated. The problem of democratic politics, Mofe argues, is not how to eliminate or tame power, as Habermas hoped, but how to constitute forms of power and conflict that are compatible with democratic values. John Scott argues that only a combination of these two approaches to power can provide a basis for developing a nuanced understanding of the various social forms that power can take. The two elementary forms of social power. can be called corrective influence and pervasive persuasive influence 
Each approach has highlighted different but complementary set of mechanisms and it is possible to combine them into a more general account of the mechanisms of power. Working from the most elementary forms to the more complex patterns of domination found in states, economic structures and other associations. State. The state is one of the most central and elusive of sociological concepts. It is central because state performs so many functions and regulate almost every aspect of people's lives. This centrality also makes the state elusive for it is hard to pin down precisely which institutions constitute it and how far it extends. The classic definition of the state was given by Max Weber. For him, a state claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. Within sociology, traditionally there has been two main approaches to understand the state. One which focuses more on the dynamics of the social relations in civil society to explain the state and the other which stresses the autonomy of the political. For Marx, the state was an instrument of the ruling class. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Angels declared the executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. Later, Marxists took a more complex and nuanced view of the state in capitalist societies. Many social democratic theorists argued that workers could force through democratic reforms and then use their numerical superiority to elect socialist governments, take control of the state and through legislation construct a socialist society without having recourse to revolution. The new Marxists like Nicholas Polantas, Nikos Polantas argued that the state required some autonomy from capital if it was to maintain the capitalist system, for it could only act in the long-term interests of capital as a whole if it had some detachment from the immediate concerns of particular capitalist interests. The traditional Marxist approach to state has come under increasing criticism from many who hold that it does not allow states sufficient autonomy. The mainstream understanding of state in much of the political sociology is dominated by Weberian approaches. Theda Scotchpol argues that the state can be considered as an autonomous actor in many situations. She maintains that states do not anyway simply act on behalf of classes for the requirements of maintaining order and managing national affairs in an international context, give those who control states some autonomy from the demands of domestic interest groups. In recent times, we have had historical and ethnographic studies of state which see the structuralist and functionalist analysis of the state, be it Weberian or the various Marxist political economy approaches as inadequate in understanding the state. Firstly, these approaches have questioned the strict boundary between state and society. Scholars like Philip Abrahams, Timothy Michel question the idea of state as a bounded entity separate from society and argue that the boundary is historical, shifting and an act of power relations. Similarly, Akhil Gupta argues for historicizing and provincializing the distinction between state and civil society that is so often assumed to be universal and natural. He says the distinction is a reflection of a particular conjecture of European history and that it may not describe or capture post-colonial realities where the boundaries between the state and non-state realms are blurred. Timothy Michel argues that we must take such distinction not as boundary between two discrete entities but as a line drawn internally within the network of institutional mechanisms through which a social and political order is maintained. He says that once we see the boundary between the state and civil society is itself an effect of power that we can begin to conceptualize the state within and not automatically distinct from other institutional forms through which social relations are lived such as family, civil society and economy. Secondly, ethnographic studies of the state have shown that the state's power is always disaggregated, that it operates through dispersed networks of power. State is just one power in a wide landscape of power. Das and Poole observe that modern state does not always possess the firm, always possess the firmness that many assume to be essential to its functioning. An ethnographic study of the state thus enables us to examine that its rule is coordinated and consolidated through the dispersed institutional and social networks and the roles that non-state institution communities and individuals play in mundane processes of governance. 
status. Within sociology, status relations can be seen in terms of particular status situations that individuals occupy. The actual social groups that can be formed on the basis of status situations are social estates, a term sometimes loosely translated as status group. These social strata are divided by their social honor or social standing and follow a particular style of life. Examples of status-based systems include caste system. Max Weber was a pioneer in studying status sociologically. Status in Weber's theory refers to differences between social groups in the social honor or prestige they are accorded by others. Where class referred to social differences based on economic division and inequalities, status designated the differentiation of groups in the communal sphere in terms of the social honor and social standing. While Marx argued that status distinctions are the result of class divisions in society, Weber argued that status often varies independently of class divisions. Position of wealth normally tends to confer high status, but there are many exceptions. The term genteel poverty refers to one example. Well, in Britain, for example, individuals from aristocratic families continue to enjoy considerable social esteem even when their fortunes have been lost. Conversely, a new money is often looked on with scorn by the well-established wealthy. Weber argued that we wish to designation, designate a status situation every typical component of life chances of people that is determined by specific positive or negative social estimation of honor. Weber saw class and status as factors that operate alongside with each other in all actual societies. Thus, particular forms of social stratification will show elements of each. Nevertheless, he recognized that societies can be distinguished by the relative importance of class and status and that it is possible to identify a broad transition in European societies from traditional status society to class societies of modernity. In recent times, the sociological importance of status and honor has been revived by the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, who argued that lifestyle choices are an important indicator of class. He argues that economic capital, which consists of material goods such as property, wealth, income, was important, but that it also provided partial understanding of class. Bourdieu argues that individuals increasingly distinguish themselves from others not according to economic factors but on the basis of cultural capital which includes education, appreciation of arts, consumption and leisure pursuits. People are aided in the process of accumulating cultural capital by the proliferation of need merchants selling goods and services either symbolic or actual for the consumption within the capital system. Also important in Bodhi's analysis of class is social capitals, one's network of friends and contacts. Bodhi defined social capital as the resources that individuals or groups gain by virtue of possessing a durable network of more or less institutional, institutionalized relationships of mutual acquaintance and recognition. Lastly, Bodhi argues that symbolic capital, which includes a position of a good reputation, is the final important indication of social class. The idea of symbolic capital is similar to that of social status. Each type of capital in Bodhi's account is related and to an extent being in position of one can help in the pursuit of the others. To conclude therefore, class as a concept in the Marxist framework is a simplistic understanding of two opposing classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Whereas in the Weberian, it is more complex wherein you have more variables like status and party coming in. Finally, both the Marxist and the Weberian concepts are forged through a new kind of understanding of class, especially by Pierre Bourdieu, who for instance understands class not only through the means of production, but also uh, through consumption. And therefore, his concepts of cultural, social and symbolic capital are very important and instructive. Similarly, Foucault's understanding of power which 
does not necessarily reside in the state but is something which is relative and is embedded in the knowledge structure or the episteme is also a very instructive lesson we got in this particular module. Thank you.